Let's get professional, roll those sleeves up. Let's go. Hey guys, what's up? It's me, Ashley, and today I am here with a very different video and a very scratchy voice. Normally I like to educate on makeup and all that good stuff. I like to tell stories, but today we are taking the literary analysis approach. Woohoo! Yay! Ashley's gonna be a teacher. We're so excited. I know, but bear with me and let me show you what my $40,000 worth of college debt has taught me. As always, if you guys enjoy this video, leave me a big thumbs up. If you guys have any questions or just want to nerd out with me about literature, let me know in the comments below and hit that subscribe button because why not? You're already here. It's like one click away. So without further ado, let's jump in to the novel. Sherlock Holmes, you know, this box. And then there's Dr. Watson, his sidekick. This one, this one, yeah. The Hound of the Baskervilles is a crime fiction novel written by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who, if you didn't already know, is the creator and mastermind between Sherlock Holmes and his sidekick, Dr. Watson. There have been many interpretations of the show. BBC has one. We have the Sherlock Holmes movies that are so famous, as well as some older movies as well. Arthur Conan Doyle was not always a writer as he started out his career in medical school. He went to med school and afterwards he opened his own ophthalmology practice in London which sadly failed but because of his failed practice and all this extra time on his hands he came up with our men Sherlock and Watson. The two men were constructed after peers and mentors that he had while he was in med school. Soon after he started writing, he published A Study in Scarlet, which was actually published to a literary magazine where he first introduced Sherlock and his trusty sidekick, Watson. Now his crime novels became so popular in London, mostly due to the fact that at the time, shortly afterwards really, Jack the Ripper was on the loose. <laughs> This mysterious and unknown serial killer brought a lot of uneasiness to Londoners and reading these Sherlock novels kind of gave them hope that a detective like Sherlock could help London and find this mass murderer. Now that is obviously speculation and analysis from multiple sources, but it makes sense when you think about it. Everybody wants to feel safe and maybe this fictitious detective who can figure out everything really could exist. It was due to the success of his first publication in Strand Magazine that led to the Sherlock Holmes that we know today. But like I said, I do English, I don't do history, so history lesson, over. I love the topic of serial killers, but maybe we'll get into that in another video. Is it bad that I say I love the subject of serial killers? I can't be the only one, right? Any good crime fiction fan can tell you that these two men together are a match made in heaven. Or are they? This is what I'm going to be discussing in today's video, is the condescending, intricate, and so crazy relationship that the two have that most of the time is not seen by the general public, those who watch the movies, the shows, and even those who read the books. At a faraway glance, it is very obvious to see that Sherlock does send a lot of jabs in Watson's direction. Although it seems that Dr. Watson is not affected by his partner's condescending comments, it makes you think, are things as dandy as they seem behind the scenes when the mysteries are solved? The Hound of the Baskervilles does give a slight glimpse into their relationship when they're not solving crimes and fighting bad guys, but not enough to where I can full-heartedly say that they are buds on and off camera. According to an article written by John and James Kissane, it seems that Sherlock Holmes's genius isn't all that it's cracked up to be. They attribute his ways of thinking and coming up with problem-solving skills to just every average man's attribute of deduction. Most times it is pretty obvious that Holmes comes to conclusions based off of observations and comments made by Watson. So in that regard it makes you think, why do we think he's all he, you know, he's cracked up to be? The Hound of the Baskervilles is a perfect example of a crime fiction narrative as it is set in a moor in a really dark and dingy and swampy area. There are really weird family ties and heirs that don't rightfully get their fortune so they kill the person who got the fortune instead and it's all this big elaborate thing. In addition to all this drama with the Baskervilles, the heir, the money, all the backstabbing and drama that goes on, and death. A lot of people die. There's also the appearance of a seemingly supernatural puppy. 
Although it is later debunked in the end, for a while you were thinking that there is some rabid, demonic dog on the loose. You think he's just out to kill the family and that he may be the culprit. Turns out he's been trained by the man who was wronged out of his fortune to kill the heir who did collect the money. Anyways, it's a great book, 10 out of 10, would recommend. You can look up more summaries online or you can just read the book for yourself. Either way, there are a few very important things I think we should go over regarding this novel in comparison to other Conan Doyle novels. In particular though, I think that this novel deserves a different kind of treatment than other Sherlock narratives. One of the big plot points is that Sherlock sends Watson to the moor to kind of figure out what's going on on his own. Normally we see Sherlock really taking control of things, kind of guiding Watson to where he wants him to be and to do what he wants him to do. But in this instance, Watson kind of has full reign of the whole investigation. Notice I said kind of because that sneaky Sherlock Holmes, although Robert Downey Jr. Sherlock is so beautiful, he's actually playing a game of I Spy. The entire time that Watson thinks he is at this moor with the Baskervilles, by himself, doing his own investigation, Sherlock is hiding out on the outskirts of the premise and doing his own investigations. Now before we figure out that Watson is not exactly alone at the moor, you think, okay, well, here we go. Sherlock Holmes is giving him power to lead his own investigation. He trusts him. He knows that he'll do a good job and finish everything out. Find the conclusion, find the suspect, done, done, done. It seems that he has so much faith in him and that his dear friend is going to do the job just as well as he can. So why read into a novel like this? Why look at the relationship between characters who seem fine and dandy? Well, this is what my education has taught me. You can always read between the lines. While doing this research, I thought, why would anyone want to ruin the idea of this perfect sidekick detective duo because they just seem and like exactly that, they seem perfect. We enjoy the novels, we love the narrative, we love the characters, so why try to ruin it for ourselves? Because that's what English majors do. We come in and we drop a bomb on your day. The novel opens up on the two solving a mini mystery leading into the narrative at the moor with the Baskervilles. During the first few pages, it is very evident that there is a little friction between the two. Although it definitely becomes more obvious throughout the novel, there are definite signs within the first few pages that Sherlock may or may not really understand the value of his partner. With more attention paid to Watson in this novel and more action and dialogue surrounding just him on his own, it is a lot easier to dissect the relationship between the two. Due to more research I have done, I really was asking myself the question, is Sherlock Holmes' knowledge actually superior to Watson's or is it all just a mirage? Personally, I think that there are things that Sherlock Holmes does pick up on in order to bring Dr. Watson into the light, but at the same time, it is very obvious that Watson often leads Sherlock to the conclusions instead of the other way around. It's kind of like, say, if Dr. Watson held all the pieces of a puzzle and he gave them to Sherlock, and Sherlock is a person who put them together. For a quick second, let's pretend that Dr. Watson is a woman, and that these things that Sherlock is saying and doing in regards to him are the exact same. How would we perceive that kind of character, and how would we look at that kind of relationship? I think at that point, it would be easier to say that because of the gender difference, it's obvious that Sherlock holds superiority over the woman. And I hate saying that because it's not true, but considering the time and considering this premise, it kind of is. Now because Watson is a man, there isn't that gender difference, it is much easier to say that their cattiness and condescending words are due to ego and due to proving who's the bigger man, who's more macho, and you know, all that stuff that we've kind of had ingrained into our minds since the beginning of time. Had Dr. Watson been a woman, we would be looking at a completely different narrative altogether and the general consensus of this topic would be very one-sided in saying that due to her gender, she is treated lesser. And it's sad, and I hate to say it, but it really is the truth. If this were to be a different novel with different gendered characters, we would see it in a bit of a different light. Now, gender aside, and you know, the potential changes, what does this relationship say about the sidekick in general? Overall, including Holmes's relations with other characters in the novel, it seems that he is able to recognize everybody's flaws but his own. At this point in the novel, I thought it was very interesting to note that Sir Arthur Conan Doyle is kind of leaving it to the reader to distinguish the difference between Sherlock being conceitful and being humorous. 
Leaving this up to interpretation is what led me here today to question the relationship and really look further into these two characters. All in all, this novel really leads us to question what kind of impact the detective or hero has on his sidekick. The sidekick is always so reliable and so good-hearted that it really makes you wonder if these superior characters take advantage of it. And if that is the case, then how are we supposed to feel for the sidekick? Because I feel sympathy. It makes you feel bad that there's this genius sitting here and he's just being beat down and beat down and beat down by someone who's probably no smarter than he is. He also uses a lot of belittling phrases such as my dear Watson or meet my good friend Watson, seeming to put a lot of worthiness into his character, but it doesn't actually make you feel like he believes that. Why patronizing, Sherlock? Why do you have to be patronizing? That's like the worst kind of person you can be. But these belittling words and his constant need to put Watson's ideas and assumptions about their job down really shows Sherlock's need to make his partner feel inferior. This tone is set very early on in the narrative, leading me to believe that the author did indeed want us to form a strong opinion about the two early on because it would affect the novel and the plotline going forward. Critical readers of the novel had similar opinions. So basically what I'm telling you is to go read this book. Prove me wrong, prove me right. I'm so curious to know what you guys think. And to leave you with one more question that may Dr. Watson has been the true hero throughout the entire Sherlock Holmes series. And we were just too blinded by Mr. Fancy Pants to realize it. Clearly I'm not a huge fan of Sherlock Holmes. Here we go, here's my bias. Although there are points in the novel where you see Watson humanizing Sherlock, there are a ton of more instances of how Sherlock puts down his sidekick. So let me know what you guys thought about this or if you have any opinions or if you just want to say hi in the comments below. I promise not to throw these at you all the time, but now that I filmed one for class, I'm kind of into it. Plus I get to wear this blazer and I just feel really cool and like scholarly. If you're a reader and you have not yet read this novel, go pick it up. And if you don't care, don't bother telling me. As always, my social media links will be in the description box for you. And if you've not yet subscribed, make sure to hit that little red button or my face right here, as well as if you're not caught up on my most recent videos, they'll be over here. Thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed today's video and go get your read on.